Today we are talking sowing, germination, and propagation. In other words, how to get from this to this. Our goal is to create dozens of healthy, disease, and deficiency-free, vigorous young plants, roots exploding top to bottom throughout the plug, just bursting to get out of the cell tray and into a nursery pot. Woohoo! We're doing everything indoors, taking courage from the fact that Mother Nature already does such a great job of germinating seeds all by herself outdoors. Here in my basement, my seedlings will enjoy a stable, controllable temperature. I'll use fewer seeds overall, and there are no slugs, snails, or other pests around to hinder my progress. Links to supplies and equipment in the description below if by the end of this video you've come over all monkey see monkey do. <laughs> Sounds like you're ready. Let's get started. I'm sowing Batavian lettuce and a bunch of different tomatoes. Lettuce is a light feeder while my tomatoes, on the other hand, are standing and is my choice of heavy fruiting, fast growing annuals. So I'm making up two separate seedling mixes, a light feeding mix for stuff like lettuce and a heavier feeder seedling mix. The only difference is the amount of powdered organic nutrition I'm adding. Seeds are an amazing evolutionary adaptation because they allow plant life to take some time out until conditions are just right to start the next generation. Let me quickly show you the grow tent I'm using for propagation. Of course, you don't have to use a tent. A bright windowsill and a warm room will suffice. I can start a lot of seedlings using a whole lot less floor space and there's a lot more protection from pests. This is my home box Vista Medium. I've been using it for about two years now. It measures two feet by four feet. Actually, it's an inch or so over four feet long, 125 centimeters to be exact the extra inch is important <clears throat> because it means it can accommodate four foot long lighting fixtures and garland growing trays for example with one shelf like this i can fit eight full-size propagators it comes with a second shelf affording theoretical space for 12 propagators but i like more vertical space especially with multi-array t5 fixtures a cool feature with this tent is that shelves can be added height adjusted and removed without having to dismantle the tent my basement has my home's hot water pipes running through it which helps keep ambient temperatures in the mid 60 degrees Fahrenheit or around 18 degrees Celsius, even in the depths of winter. In the summer, it only creeps up a few degrees. Seeds love consistent warmth and moisture. Grow tents are arguably easier and cheaper to keep warm than a whole room. As you can see, different plants want different conditions. But if you aim for 75 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius inside your propagators, you're good for most types of seed. Be sure to place your min-max thermometer or wireless environmental sensor inside the propagator itself so you can get an accurate in-situ read. I've squeezed in a Razor X LED propagation light made by Fluence Bioengineering at the top here. Three LED strips providing a broad spectrum of white light covering eight square feet. Incredible! At five inches distance, this fixture delivers an average of 242 micromoles of light, just over 300 in the center and 180 at the edges. Plenty of light for sure, but precious little infrared warming. So, if I'm using this to propagate warm season crops such as tomatoes or chilies in a cool basement room like this, I also deploy a heat mat underneath the propagator too linked to a thermostatic controller. I also have the LED fixture at the top of the tent where it naturally is a little warmer. I position the heat mat thermostat's temperature probe in the propagator in a similar way to the MinMax thermometer remote probe. For cool season crops like lettuce, there's no need to bother with heat mats unless it's really cold. I prefer full-size propagators, 14 by 9 inches, as they are less prone to overheating. T5 fluorescent tubes are great for starting my tomatoes as they produce more infrared heat than LEDs, but I keep them a good 5 inches or so away from the propagator lids otherwise they can overheat. Here I'm using a Sunblaze T5 fixture housing 254 watt high output 4 foot power veg full spectrum fluorescent tubes from iHortalux. The form factor of this fixture is a lot narrower so only capable of covering two propagators. Seedlings prefer multi-point diffuse lighting positioned directly above them so they grow straight up. Note that I only switch my grow lights on when seedlings have begun to emerge. Using light from the get-go isn't normally an issue though, and some species, like mint, need it for germination. Like I said, T5 fluorescence can provide some helpful heat too if you don't have heat mats. For crops like tomatoes, I shoot for 18 hours on and 6 hours off. Lettuce needs just 12 hours, same for beets, spinach, and turnips. It's easier to maintain stable temperatures with a 24-hour light cycle, but this is not ideal for the aforementioned crops, and plus you can save a bunch on your energy costs. If if you're worried about the lights off temperatures dropping too low, use a thermostatically controlled heat mat. Now taller domes are handy for fast growing seedlings like French beans and cucumbers. You can get away with shallower domes for lower profile or slower growing crops like peppers, lettuce, and broccoli. Inserts. I'm talking about little plastic trays that sit inside your propagator are most commonly in the form of cell trays. Just a bunch of plastic molded compartments designed to hold the little propagation media for each seedling. 
Typical configurations are 32, 50, or 72 cells. Obviously, the more cells in your tray, the less media each seedling will have in its first stage, and the quicker you'll need to transplant. Figure about one gallon of seedling mix per full-size propagator. Faster-growing plants like beans and cucumbers are arguably more suited to larger cells if you can accommodate their speedy vertical growth. Otherwise, I find 72 cell trays are the most space-efficient choice for pretty much everything I grow. A seedling mix needs to be fine, no big chunks, so it's easy for young roots to penetrate, but not so fine that it's prone to compaction. Think fibrous and powdery materials rather than large chips or wood bark. For me, the best base is a 70-30 mix of buffered coco coir and small pieces of perlite. You can use 100% coco coir, that's just fine too. I just find that the added perlite helps to mitigate the risk of overwatering and overcompaction. You can buy it pre-mixed and ready to use like this. The 50-50 coco perlite mixes and other high porosity mixes are designed for older plants. This particular brand, EcoThrive, already comes with insect frass pre-mixed in too, providing a nice broad spectrum of nutrition and microbiology. So my lettuce mix, a gallon of 70-30 cocoa perlite, two cups of compost, 10 grams of powdered organic nutrition, and mix that all up in a bucket. Then I take a liter of reverse osmosis water. Use the purest water you can find. I add a gram of beneficial biology in five milliliters of kelp extract. Stir it up and pour it over the seedlings mix in the bucket. Mix together really thoroughly and your seedling mix is ready to go for your cell trays. Seedlings want a broad spectrum of nutrition. Nitrogen for stem and leaf growth along with phosphorus and potassium for root development and overall vigor. Some growers hear phosphorus and potassium and they think they should use a powder nutrient mix designed for bloom. But my seedlings just need a trace, not an abundance. And too much phosphorus can inhibit the growth of beneficial mycorrhizae fungi. Propagation is always the most cost-effective time to add this stuff, especially mycorrhizae. My tomato seedling mix is exactly the same, except I'm using 20 grams of meal mix grow formula. The seedling mix should feel moist, but not sodden. Squeeze it and only a few drops of water, if any, should come out. Then I start spreading handfuls over my cell tray. Take your time and be methodical at this stage. Be extra careful to get even amounts of mix into the cells, especially those trickier ones lurking on the corners and the edges. I press down lightly with two fingers in each cell and add more mix until there's just a few millimeters at the top. So one or two seeds per cell. Don't plant too deep, just a seed's depth down. Tiny seeds like this can be simply pressed into the surface. Large Larger seeds can go deeper. In any case, the goal is to create good contact all around between the seed and moist growing media. It's preferable to grow the same variety of plant and the same propagator rather than mixing them up so that all your seedlings are broadly at the same stage per propagator. Okay, so we're done. Lightly spray the trays with some water, put the lid on, vents closed like I said earlier. As soon as you see seedlings emerge for lettuces, it can take one or two days. For tomatoes, maybe a few days longer. Make sure your grow lights are on. What's next? Well, it's all about tough love. Sure, you've got to nurture your little seedlings, but you can't baby them. Remember, our goal is to produce tough, vigorous seedlings capable of surviving the real world outside of the propagator. Now, don't keep your propagator vents closed or your propagator lid on for too long. Open up the vents as soon as your seedlings have all emerged, and this will bring the relative humidity down from 100% to around 90. If your grow lights are providing enough heat, turn off your heat mats. Seedlings can quickly become leggy if heated for too long. Gradually lowering your relative humidity encourages your seedlings to start transpiring. That is pulling up essential elements such as calcium and boron, for example. If you keep your propagator vents closed for too long, the high humidity actually slows the growth and produces overly tender plant tissue, which in turn invites molds. A week or so after emergence, you should place your propagator lid slightly ajar or tilt it up a bit using a small object. This will bring relative humidity closer to ambient levels. The ideal is around 65 to 70 percent, perfect to get your seedlings working. After a few days of this, get that propagator lid off completely. Most types of seedling will spend at least two weeks in my propagation tent and I want at least a week of that to be without a propagator lid. My grow tent is ventilated using this six inch hyperfan dialed down to minimum on 24 seven. I recirculate the exhausted air back into the room. No need to vent it to the outside world at this stage. Of course, if I had a room full of propagation tents, I would need to exchange the room's air once every three or four minutes. I turn the fan up to around 40 or 45 percent, but no more once I have a full tent of transpiring happy seedlings. The last thing seedlings want is a gale force wind though. All home box Vista tents come with these handy adjustable air vents that allow you to make really subtle micro adjustments to the direction of incoming air. You can see what I mean if I show you through the viewing window. I don't want to see too much movement, just a shimmer. So up here I use a small oscillating fan to blow a gentle breeze across my seedlings, particularly important when the cell trays start to get crowded. Try to primarily move the air between plants and the light rather than blowing strongly on the plants themselves or they can dry out. Let's 
Let's talk irrigation. You shouldn't need to re-moisten your seedlings for the first three or four days. If you start to see the top of the seedling mix lighten in color like it's drying out, use a sprayer to mist them with pure water. If you're starting seedlings in a mix with no added nutrition, I suggest making up a super mild mineral nutrient solution. An EC of 0.4 to 0.6 millisiemens or 200 to 300 ppm will suffice. As a general guide, I allocate 10 to 20 milliliters of water per seedling per irrigation in a 72 cell tray. Usually applied once every Every three days, sometimes misting a little in between. Be careful not to get Mr. Complacent, merely wetting the surface so it looks watered but not penetrating down to all the media. If at transplant time you find that all your roots are concentrated near the top of the plug, you know you've been underwatering. Time how long it takes your mister to deliver 10 to 20 milliliters so you know how long to hover over each cell in the tray. Generally speaking, seedlings should be kept moist but allowed to dry just a little in between irrigations, definitely to no less than half of their saturated weight. Some species, like cucumbers and Chinese celery, for example, enjoy being kept very moist. Others, basil and chilies, prefer less moisture. The perlite in the mix really helps to mitigate the risk of overwatering, so don't worry too much. If you get to the point where you find that you need to irrigate your seedlings every day, then that's a sure sign that they are ready for a transplant out of those cell trays. If I'm in a hurry, I use a small watering can or container and water in rows like this. You'll want to make sure that you completely moisten all the media in each cell. Inevitably, some water will pool at the bottom of the propagator tray which I pour away so no roots are sitting in stagnant water. Remember, your seedlings' time in the cell tray are going to be delimited by one or more of three factors. Either they've run out of root space, they've run out of vertical space, and they're growing too close to your propagation lights, or they're simply overcrowded by their neighbors. A good test is to lift the whole propagator in order to judge if it needs watering or not. I really recommend removing the whole propagator from the grow tent and spending at least 15 minutes a day per propagator checking each seedling. If more than one seedling emerges in the same cell, wait a few days to see if there's a stronger seedling and remove the weaker one by simply snipping it out with a pair of clean trimming systems. Scissors. Pulling it out by the roots can disturb the seedling you're leaving in place. Consistent temperatures are key. Mid 70s is ideal for most plant species, and that's around 25 degrees Celsius. When it's time for transplant, the roots should have totally exploited all the media in the cell and be bursting to get out. They pop out really easily if you wait until the media is a little drier before transplanting. They're a lot easier to handle, too. Simply lift up the cell tray and gently push upwards at the base with your fingers. Do it gently with minimal root disturbance. If it doesn't pop out easily, you may be a little premature. I find that tomatoes usually need transplanting three weeks after emergence. If your seedlings start to stretch, it's a sure sign that you don't have enough light. Either lower your grow lights or transfer to a more powerful light source. Leggy tomatoes can be easily corrected by planting them deeper upon transplantation. Buried tomato stems will go on to produce roots. But hey, I'll save transplanting for another time. You can easily go into a soil-based or soilless mix from here. The choice is yours, amigo. But before I go... I'll finish up with a final thought. Propagation is not unlike riding a bike up a hill. Right from the get-go, you need to understand that it's going to take some time, effort, and energy, and you need to choose the right gear. You definitely shouldn't be in a rush, and you need to pay close attention throughout. Reaching the top of the hill is like getting all your transplanting done, looking proudly at all your plants ready and raring to go in their final stage pots. So long as you don't take your eye off the prize, it's freewheeling all the way down the other side of the hill into harvest to me goes. And on that note, this is Everest saying bye-bye.